few songs that we'll be doing uh, uh, just like we usually do, but uh, I'd really like you to listen to the words. Uh, of course, sing along if you'd like. But these are, these are more songs to the Lord, so they're almost, uh, they're almost prayer. So if you sing with me, great. Uh, sing it to the Lord. If you're not much of a singer, but you just kind of want to mouth the words with me, great. Mouth them to the Lord. time you spend with the Lord just uh, just kind of talking to him just spending time with him telling him you love him uh, uh, Lord I'm grateful for you uh, 
Jesus, you're beautiful. I, I don't usually pray like that. I, I don't usually just spend time saying, hey, God, you're great. You know, I believe it. I just don't usually pray like that. Uh, about 30 years ago, uh, all of the songs we're doing this morning are by, by a guy named Keith Green, a guy who just uh, fell in love with the Lord. He was kind of a crazy, crazy kid, uh, uh, religious, spiritual, kind of messed up, you know, into everything. And uh, God chased him down. Keith Green got saved, and he just, he just went crazy for Jesus. He just loved God, and, and he, he looked like a guy who really tried to give up everything for God. He, he, he found homeless people, brought them into his house, and, and, and fed everybody he could find, and, and just preached Jesus to everybody. And uh, they tell me I can be a little obnoxious when I'm trying to help a brother out. Uh, everybody around Keith just felt like you man you just you just love him or you hate him because he was just so sold out for Jesus that he he, he couldn't leave well enough alone I love Jesus you should love him too I, I, I'm, I'm all four feet in for Jesus you ought to be all four feet in for Jesus too but every once in a while from his songs would just come this this sensitive sensitive heart oh Lord you're beautiful your face is all I seek and when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds to me. Yo 
face is all I seek. Your face is all I seek. And when your eyes, and when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds to me. Chain of thy own 
Thine Spirit within me. To the Lord, sing that with me. Renew. And renew Thine Spirit within me. Oh God, oh Lord. You are beautiful. You are worthy. You are Savior. You are God. Thank you for saving us. God, we are so amazed that you still work with us. You still live in us. God, I pray that we would do a better job of, of just moving in your direction, of recognizing that, that everything we have, we have as a gift from you. Lord, thank you for saving us. Please, please, please change us. Make us into your image. Make us just like you, we pray. In your name, amen. Amen. No, you do it. This is evolution. Poor puppy, nobody to play with him? <laughs> you ever feel like you're alone in this, uh, in this life, in this endeavor? You're not alone. It's kind of cute watching the puppy play catch with himself. But, uh... You gonna play? You gonna play? You're not gonna play? I'll play. You're not alone in this thing. If you're a believer, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ will never leave you. He will never forsake you. If you sin, He's waiting for you to come to Him and confess your sins so that He can forgive your sins. Jesus Christ will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never turn His back on you. He will never walk away from you. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, if you are a believer, then you're His. Jesus said, you're in my hand, my hand is in the hand of the Father, no man can pluck you out. If you're a believer, you're His. And if you're a believer, you're not only His, but you're held. The Bible says that you're close in Him. In fact, the Bible says that He's in you. Can't get any closer than that. You're not only His, but you're held. And the Bible says that, believe it or not, look around, you're holy. Not just like my socks. I mean, like a saint. Like better than any pope because it's not something a, a, a group of people or a, or, a, or a church confers upon you. The Bible says that when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you become a saint. You become a holy one with God. When you become a believer, you're His and you're held. And the Bible says that at that moment of justification, at that moment of salvation, you are made holy and your entire life now is a privilege. Everything you have is a gift from God. Your breath your life, your time. Now that you're a child of God, your ministry, it all belongs to Jesus Christ. This Christian life is a privilege. Uh, I'm a steward. Uh, back in the old days when they called flight attendants stewardesses, right? You'd get on a plane and they'd offer, this is back before they charged for everything. They, they, they'd bring you coffee and Cokes and little things that came in little bottles and I don't know what those were. And they'd offer you blankets and magazines and pillows. Did the stewardess own any of those things? That flight attendant owned none of that. That flight attendant was a stewardess or the guys were stewards. A steward literally is a manager who dispenses things that belong to someone else. The Bible says that once you give your life to Jesus Christ, once you become a believer, you are a steward or stewardess, flight attendant for this life. You're not in this alone. God didn't save you and leave you. God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. But He wants us to grasp that, that deep, deep, amazing truth that you are not alone. That doesn't just mean that He's there to help you in your life. It means you get to help Him in His. That doesn't mean you get to sprinkle a little Jesus on your life. It means you get to immerse your life in His. The Christian life is a privilege. It's a high and holy calling. The Christian life isn't just something, oh yeah, I'm a Baptist. 
I mean, that's like telling people you're stupid. I mean, it, it, I'm a Baptist. I'm a Baptist preacher. I'm an ordained Southern Baptist preacher. Glory. That doesn't mean anything. doesn't impress God. doesn't impress anybody around here. barely impresses people if they're in the Bible Belt. It doesn't impress anybody to say I'm a Baptist or that you're a Baptist. Now, it kind of tells me something about you. If you're willing to identify as a Baptist or you're willing to identify with a Baptist church, well, it tells me that you probably kind of believe the Bible and, 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 you, and you probably believe that baptism is important. <coughs> you probably believe that there's a whole bunch of lists of do's and don'ts. You, you probably believe that everybody needs to be born again. Everybody needs to get saved. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't exactly tell people what you believe. But it does tell them more or less. It does tell them more or less where you are. But I want you to get this. You are a Christian. You are a believer. You are a partner. And this life that you live is a, say it with me, it's a privilege. He lets you partner with him. He lets you live in him. He lets you represent him. God has left you. He's left you not alone. He's left you with his comforter. And now that he's in you, he lets you into a privileged position in Christ. Uh, you're a child of God. Uh, you're sons. You're, you're an heir uh, with Christ Jesus. Uh, Paul said it like this to the church in Galatia. For you are all, he's talking to the believers, right? All of you are children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. <coughs> Romans 8, 17. And since we are his children, we are heirs. What's an heir? Now, I've already figured out dad's trying to spend everything before he croaks so that he doesn't have to leave anything. But if he leaves anything, well, I, you know, I'm going to have to duke it out with Berta and Connie and Eddie, you know, because we are joint heirs. Right? He may decide to leave everything to them and, you know, kind of leave me out. But technically, we are heirs, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Is that for me? You think you're getting points for this? No. No. <laughs> Thank you. You are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of his glory. That's kind of a cool thing. Now, when is God ever going to die so you can get yours? When, when do you move into that inheritance? When, when, when does that have to happen? Now, I guess technically we could say, well, Jesus died, and, and he is our spiritual brother, and when he died, we get it. It doesn't work like that. Basically, what the Bible is teaching is that everything that belongs to God, he's chosen to pass on to us because we are heirs inheritors. We are heirs and joint heirs with Christ and all of our brothers and sisters. We get that inheritance, not when he dies, but when we die. It's all been given to us now. Um, and we accept by faith. That doesn't mean, oh, I believe, I believe, I believe real hard. That's not what faith is. Faith is the, the belief that you have based on the belief taught in the Bible. The Bible says what it says. So I believe what I believe. That is faith. Faith isn't just what you believe. Faith is what you believe that comes out of the Bible. All right? That belief, that faith, guarantees that I'm not only in Him, but I'm with Him, and He's going to give me whatever He's chosen to give me. Not when He dies, but when we die. So by faith, I believe all these things. By faith, I believe that I'm an heir with Christ. When I go to be with Him, I get everything. Now you're a part of a new family, a part of a new family. And the new family that we're a part of, his family, not just this family, we're kind of a dysfunctional bunch that just kind of makes us kind of normal. You know, look around and we're kind of nice to hang out with here. I don't know that we want to go home with anybody, but we're a part of a spiritual family. The spiritual family that you're a part of is different from just a regular earthly family, but earthly families can be interesting. All right, Jennifer, have you ever been in love? Yes. <laughs> At age what were you in love? Seven, and he was cute, and he wasn't very smart, though. <laughs> Did you kiss? Did you kiss? Nope. Do your mother and father love each other? Very much. <laughs> How do you know? When they're in a romantic mood. 
Don't you know mom and dad are so afraid? What are they going to do? What? <laughs> well, they kiss a lot. Just a second. What your name is? Brandon. Brandon Wolf. Brandon. Your mother and father? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where are they? Right up there, top the those people. Yes. Waiting. Um. All right. Now those two. Yeah. Have you ever seen them in a romantic mood? Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> You've seen them kiss. A lot. Your mother and father. That they love each other. They have to. <laughs> is, is it is it something religious? No. No. I mean, we're Jewish, but a lot of other religions. <laughs> they don't have to be married to have to love each other. So. <laughs> now, according according to your own judgment, who are the five? Best looking men in the world. My daddy. Number two. Denzel Washington. <laughs> Number three. Tom Cruise. <laughs> Number four. Is Brad Pitt. <laughs> looking men. These are handsome people. What do your thoughts lead you to? Um, if we ever get married. If they ever get married, what? Um, and then dump them. <laughs> wow. That's not what your mother did with your father. I know, but I have to move on to Denzel. <laughs> Now, you are, <laughs> you're part of a new family. Hopefully, not like that, right? <laughs> That's crazy, huh? You're part of a new family. God will never leave you. God will never dump you. Yeah? God will never move on to Denzel. God picked you. God picked you. Okay, your turn. God picked. Thank you very much. Feel like Bill. What about me? God picked us. You're part of his family. You are privileged. You're a privileged bunch. Now we're not supposed to act like it. We're not supposed to act like we're all that, you know, uh, narcissists with uh, entitlement issues. We're not supposed to act like we think we're all that. The cool thing is he thinks we're all that. God has let you into a privilege protection in Christ. Proverbs 30 verse 5, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to all who come to Him for protection. Psalm 89, 18. Not only, not only this position we have in Christ now, but this protection we have says, our protection comes from the Lord. Psalm 91, 4. He will cover you with His feathers. You ever picture God with feathers? The Bible says that He gathers us uh, like, a, like, a, like a hen gathering her chicks. The Bible says God covers us with His feathers, with His pinions. Now, God doesn't have feathers any more than God has eyes or hands or arms. But God uses something called anthropomorphisms. That's a 25-cent word, huh? God uses anthropomorphisms where he attributes a human characteristics to, uh, well, in this case, himself, to God. God is spirit. He's not flesh and bone. God is not flesh. So he doesn't have feathers and he doesn't have eyes and he doesn't have an arm. But when he expresses himself, he uses these expressions to communicate his love and his concern and your position and here, your protection. The fact that he will shelter you with 
His wings. He's let you into a, a position in Christ. He's let you into a new protection in Christ. This has been all over TV, the internet. You've probably seen this a hundred times already. This little guy who's playing outside, they must have a lot of security cameras that they have all these different shots, but he's outside playing. If you haven't seen this, there's a dog from next door kind of been scoping this kid out. He goes around the van, grabs the kid, starts mauling him, pulling him, pulling. I don't know where he's going to take him. The cat comes and rescues the kid. You see that the cat came and chased the dog away. He body slammed that dog. It's kind of cool. Huh? It's been all over, all over TV, all over the interweb, all over the internet. Heroic cat rescues kid. Uh, in, the, in the earlier service, at the 8.30 service, we were looking at passages of Scripture that, that tell us that God protects us, God keeps us, God watches over us, that He'll never let us stumble, He'll never let us fall, that no one will ever harm us, no one will ever hurt us. And I had to admit, I don't even know what those passages mean. I believe them because they're in the Bible. But just understanding it with my little pea brain, uh, I stumbled before. I've been hurt, haven't you? I've had people hurt me. I've had people threaten to hurt me. You've had people threaten to hurt you. I, I've, actually, I've actually been hurt. So what does it mean that God protects and God will keep us from hurt and God will never let us stumble? My answer is I don't know, but I believe it. I believe that God watches over us in ways that we just don't grasp. God's goal is not your comfort. God's goal is not your satisfaction. God's goal is His glory and His satisfaction. Now, if we're not careful, it, it'll sound like God is this uh, megalomaniac, this, this monster who's all into Himself. That's not it. The truth of the matter is, there is none like God. The Lord God, He is one. There's just one God. He's the righteous one, the sovereign one. He's the only one. And to Him and Him alone, we owe praise. We owe worship. He is worthy of our praise. He is uh, worthy of our worship. Worthship. He is worth worthy. So we worship Him. <clears throat> the word uh, worship means to lay out on your face. Proskaneo, uh, prostrate, to, to lay out on your face before God. God is the only one who's worthy of that. When I start thinking that I'm all that, then I get hung up with, what does it mean I'll never stumble? I stumble, that I'll never fall. I fall, that I'll never be hurt. I get hurt. But when I'm looking at it from God's point of view, I don't understand it. I just know the Bible teaches all things work together for good. The good stuff, the gross stuff, the blessings, the burdens, I don't understand it. But God is trying to turn you into an image of Jesus Christ. He's, he's trying to turn you into the flip side of the coin. On, on one side of the coin is Jesus. On the other side of the coin is you. And it doesn't take the same thing for me that it takes for you. What God has to do in your life is not necessarily what it takes for my life. But the name of the game is not your comfort. The name of the game is conforming to the image of Jesus Christ. So I don't know what it means completely that God will never let me get hurt, never let me stumble. God will protect me, but I know that He's protecting His interest, and that's you. And He will never let anything happen to you that will thwart His will. He will never let anything happen to you that will keep you from becoming who He wants you to be. I can go kicking and screaming. I, I may throw up a fuss. I may say, I don't want that. I don't like that. I want this. I don't want that. And it looks like God's closing the door to this. Um, I keep knocking, I keep asking, I keep seeking, I keep knocking. Uh, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. I know that's in the Bible, but I've asked for a lot of things that I don't get. Have you? I seek a lot of things I don't find. I knock on a lot of doors that are still locked. But God promises I have a new position in Him. He promises, I have a new protection in Him. God has also left, let us in to a privileged provision in Christ. Look at how He takes care of us. God not only gives us His faith. You know you couldn't even get saved if God didn't give you the gift of faith? 
Now that's kind of spooky because while it sounds like a blessed thing to know that you couldn't get in if he didn't let you in, he not only opened the door for you, he called you, he picked you up, he carried you, he brought you all the way in. You couldn't get saved unless he saved you. You couldn't even believe. Believe yes, believe no. You, you would have not the ability to believe except Jesus Christ give us that. The Bible says we were dead in trespasses and sins. You've been to funerals that were more than just a memorial. Most funeral services now are memorial services where the, the loved one has been cremated already. And so rather than coming up to an open casket, there are photographs and memorabilia. But uh, if you can remember back to maybe the, the last time if you've ever been to a funeral service where it was an open casket and the loved one was laid out there, often loved ones will come by and they'll, they'll touch their loved one. And they'll, I remember kissing my grandpa on the forehead. Uh, one of the, the coolest memories I have of my grandpa, my dad's dad, was uh, uh, he let me drive uh, on the freeway. I, I was probably nine. I don't know how old I was. but uh, This was back in the old days. We could get away with this stuff. And I, I wasn't exactly nine. I was, and I was driving. Uh, grandpa was letting my cousin drive, Billy, and he was letting me drive. And uh, he was real clear, keep it at 55. Keep it at 55. I think the speed limit back then was 120. I don't know what it was back in the olden days. Probably 75 during the day and 65 at night or something like that. But keep it at 55. Keep it at 55. And I'm driving. I'm just all happy, you know, in this old truck. <laughs> and whenever I'd go over 55, he wouldn't hit me. He wouldn't yell at me. He'd just kind of feel it. And he'd look over and go, Ole! He'd say, and I'd, oh, and I'd slow down. Ole! Let's slow down again. And yeah. When Grandpa died, uh, we were at the funeral, and, and uh, Grandpa was always so sweet. He's just so sweet. He's just so sweet. Grandpa was just a good guy. And uh, he was very, uh, he was just a, just a good guy. When I kissed him, he didn't kiss me back in the casket. He didn't give me a hug. He didn't say ole. Why not? He was just dead. Yeah, that would have been a little scary. Yeah. He, he was dead. He was gone. He wasn't in that shell anymore, right? The Bible says that before you got born again, before you got saved, the Bible says that before you came to Jesus Christ, you were dead in trespasses and sins. That means you were unable to respond to God, anybody. God had to quicken us. He had to, that's a King James word. God had to make us alive enough to be able to even respond positively or negatively. You wouldn't even have been able to respond had he not given you enough of a spark of spiritual life to be able to say yes or no to God. And the faith to believe, that's a gift from God too. God gave you faith. He gave you a family. Look around. I know, kind of spooky, but... You're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not only our Lord and Savior, but He's our brother, the Bible says. He not only gives us faith and family, but I thought I'd focus on food because that's the way I think. Matthew 6, 25, Jesus said, This is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food or drink. Why do you worry about having enough clothes to wear? Isn't life more than food? And isn't your body more than the clothing? 26, this is Jesus talking. Look at the birds. They don't plant. They don't harvest. They don't go to Circle K. They don't have to go to Walmart. Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest. They don't store food in their barns. And your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you far more valuable than those birds? Jesus is not saying those birds are nothing. He's saying these birds are precious to the heavenly Father. Which is why I don't like to step on spiders or crickets or bugs. It's not that I mean, yesterday I sprayed for ants. Somehow it's different when I step on one or if I kill a thousand at the same time, then it's a little different. But, you know, I'm not that messed up. Critters, you know, roaches, they don't count as living things. You can kill those. And, you know, things that are dangerous, you kill whatever you want. Sometime back, uh, I, I wanted my kids to realize uh, life is precious. And while, I mean, how many of us didn't have BB guns and shoot at birds and rabbits and lizards and... I feel bad about that now. Uh, Jesus said he knows when every sparrow falls. He knows when every cricket gets stepped on. He knows when you mush every spider and don't even leave juice. 
He knows. And it's not that they're unimportant. It's just that you are so much more important. He wants us to value life. That's why abortion is such a big thing. And now that I'm getting older, euthanasia for old people, that's becoming a big thing. Because we're moving into a culture, you're moving into a healthcare system where you're not gonna have a choice. Because just like New Zealand, just like Cuba, just like Canada, limited resources will be rationed. And you may be at the bottom of the list. Yeah, because it won't be free market anymore. It'll be what they decide you deserve. God knows. It doesn't matter how bad the healthcare system, it doesn't matter what donkey is behind the pulpit or in the White House, it doesn't matter. Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. Your heavenly father takes care of them because he cares about them. And aren't you far more valuable than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life or a single inch to your stature? 28. So why do you worry about what you're going to wear? Uh, we do, don't we? I mean, shoot, we worry because we don't want to look stupid to the world. We want to fit in. We, well, now I just want to fit, but most of us, we worry about whether we're going to look weird. Do you remember the agony, those of us who are already out of school, you remember the agony of buying clothes? Was it just me? I used to hate shopping for clothes at school time. I don't know if I hated it more than mom and dad, but it's just agonizing. And they only had 12 kids. Well, not that but you, you worry. I mean, there's only so much money to go around, and you, you don't want your kids to be embarrassed, and, and you want to get them what they want. And, but kids are, well, we're kind of messed up. And, and we get our ideas from TV commercials and from other kids. And back then, if you didn't have a lizard, you were out. And then later, it had to be a horse. And then later, it had to be nothing. And, you know, I remember going to school and I had stripes on my shirt and everybody else had stripes this way. And I, is this a fashion thing I missed out on or does it not matter? And it's miserable living in the world because you think you got to do everything they do. You got to look like them. You got to be like them. You got to fit in with them. I know we worry about clothes. I know we worry about food. I know we worry about electricity. We worry about stuff. Jesus is not saying be irresponsible and never be concerned. He's not saying that. He's saying don't get all wrapped. Don't get all anxious. Don't, literally, the word means don't wring your hands. Don't fret is literally what he's saying. Why do you worry about your clothes? Look at the lilies of the field. Look at how they grow. They don't work. They don't have to make their clothing. Verse 29, yet Solomon, the world's richest man, Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as the flowers. Verse 30, and if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, will he not certainly care for you? Why do you have so little faith? Why don't you just believe God? He's not saying be irresponsible. He's saying he cares about you. He cares about the little lizard and the little bird or wherever they are. And he cares more about you. 31. So I said all that to say this, Jesus said. Don't worry about these things saying what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of the unbelievers. Your heavenly father already knows what you need. This is what I want you to do. You ready? Okay, the, the whole morning, it was just to get you ready for this verse. You ready? Here you go. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So if you're going to stress about something, stress about, am I looking more like Jesus today than I was yesterday? If you're going to get anxious about something, get anxious about, do I, do I really love Jesus more today than I did yesterday? Instead of stressing over, how am I going to get that thing? How am I going to pay for this, that? How am I going to take care of my whatevers? He's not saying be irresponsible and don't be concerned about it. He's saying there's something to be concerned with that's more valuable. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will bring its own worries. Amen? I mean, there's enough trouble to go around today. Don't worry, there's even more tomorrow. Tomorrow will bring its own worries. 
today's trouble is enough for today. Hmm. God knows what you need. God knows where you are. Now, God loves to share his life with us. You know that, don't you? God loves to share with us. It's fun to share. He's a little horse. He's eating. Looks like he's eating out of a manger is what it looks like. But when you look closer, it's a partition. It's a wall. Hay's getting pushed through the bars there. Look who's feeding him. Another horse. <laughs> God loves to share his life with us. The, the, the horse is doing it intentionally. That's pretty cool, isn't it? If an animal can do that, can God? God loves to share his life with you. Trust him. God has let you into a, a privileged prospect in Christ. You have a future coming that you don't even realize. Job 19, 25. But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and that I will stand upon the earth with him at the last. That he will stand upon the earth at last. 26. And after my body has decayed. So is this today? This is after I'm dead, right? I know that my Redeemer lives, and He will stand on the earth at the last. And after my body has died and decayed, yet in my flesh I will see God. What is He counting on? A resurrection. He's not only going to see God in His spirit, He's counting on seeing God in His flesh. 27. I will see my Redeemer for myself. Yes, I will see Him with my own eyes. John said it like this, 1 John 3, 2. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but He has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we know that when, uh, that when He appears, we will be like Him, for we will see Him as He really is. God wants you to see Him as He really is, and He wants you to see you as you really are. We're sinners in need of a Savior. We're people in need of a Deliverer, a Redeemer. Now, if you're born again, and I hope you are, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, then just kind of push everything out and pray a prayer like this while I'm babbling and ranting on and on and on. A simple prayer like this, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. Jesus, I believe that you are God. And I believe when you died on the cross, you died for my sins. You died for me. Jesus, please come into my heart. Please forgive me. Please save me. Please let me into your family. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for loving me first. There's nothing magic about those words, but Jesus said, He that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. He's not going to give you the boot if you come to Him in repentance and say, Jesus, please forgive me. Please save me. He wants you to see yourself for what you are, a sinner in need of a Savior. He wants you to see Him for who He is, the sovereign God who wants to be your Savior. And when you come to Him, He will save you to the uttermost, to the very end, for all eternity, the Bible says. You're in my hand, Jesus said, and my hand is in the hand of the Father. No one can pluck you up. Jesus said the Holy Spirit has been given as an earnest, or the Apostle Paul said, as an earnest, as a down payment, as a guarantee that you're going to get the inheritance when you die. God has taken care of everything. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, but it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know when He appears, we shall be like Him, for then we shall see Him as He is. But just to see Jesus and to look upon His face, the one who sacrificed His life to take my place. Of all the wonders heaven holds for me to see, just to see Jesus will be heaven for me. Can we really see who we really are?
Can we see who you really, really are? God wants you to see yourself for who you are, a sinner in need of a Savior. And He wants you to see Him for who He is, the sovereign God who wants to be your Savior. Let the Savior get together with the sinner, that's you. Let Him forgive your sins. Let Him save you. And then move into this amazing privilege that you have. You have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But the fact that we have this relationship with him doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to cooperate with him. That's your choice. I hope you choose yes. He loved you enough to die for you. Can we trust him enough to live for him? Can we rest in that relationship? Can we just give him uh, every piece of our life? Can we trust him with every scrap? of our life? Can we trust Him with every moment of our day? Can we trust Him with every problem in our heart? Can we trust Him with every need in my life? Can I trust Him? Yes or no? And we're in church and so we're supposed to say what? Say it with me. Yeah. But wow, do we? I mean, we fight like everything to get what we think we deserve. Or if we're halfway spiritual, we fight like everything to get what we think we need. Jesus says, why do you worry about everything? That's what the unbelievers do. You're a believer. You have a relationship with me. You have a relationship with my heavenly Father. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all the stuff you need will be added unto you. Can you follow Him as He asks you to be saved? Can you follow Him as He asks you to be soaked? Can you follow Him as He asks you to be serious? Are you sure you've given your life to Jesus? Man, don't leave this building until you do. If you're sure you're saved, well, amen and amen. But if you're not sure about it, man, talk to me. You're at that black column or this black column or that uh, uh, door just before you leave. You'll find blue books. Grab a blue book. Pick that thing up. Read it. Grab a cup of coffee. Get over there in the corner. Read that thing. Pray the prayer. Or again, talk to one of us. Don't leave this building until you're sure that you're saved. And if you're really saved, you know what you ought to do then? Be obedient and get baptized. Get saved and get soaked. Once you're saved and once you show that you're truly, truly obedient to Jesus Christ, that you really love Him, then get serious. That means get into the Bible, find out what God wants you to do, and then what, guys? Just do it. That's right. Just do it. Find out what God wants you to do, and then just do it. Get saved, get soaked, get serious. Can we just give it all over to Jesus? It's the easiest thing you'll ever do and the most difficult thing you'll ever do. Just give it all over to Jesus. Lord Jesus, we want to give it all over to you. Every, every struggle, every hurt, every fear, every burden, every problem, every trial, every question, every blessing, every kid, every neighbor, every enemy. God, we just, we just want to have enough sense to just trust you with every scrap of our lives. Jesus, I trust you. I hope you can pray this with me, guys. Jesus, I trust you. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for letting me be a part of your family. Now, Jesus, please help me cooperate with you as you change my life to make me more like you. I know you know what I need. I don't know what I need, but you know what I need. Lord, help me trust you as you're bringing into my life everything I need to become more like you. In your name, amen. I made my life a prayer to you. I wanted you, what you want me to. No empty words and no white lies, no choking prayers, no compromise. Who want to shine the light you gave through your Son you sent to save us from ourselves and our despair? It comforts me to know you really
my guess I'll learn to trust and just believe what you say. Oh, you're coming again, coming to take me away. Who wanna die and let you give your life to me? So I might live and share the hope you gave to me A love that set me free And I want to tell the world out there You're not so free for the very day But I made up inside my head You're God the Son, you're risen from well, I want to thank you now for being patient with me. Oh, it's so hard to see when my eyes are on me. But I guess I'll have to trust and just be. If you can see the words up there, if you could mouth it with me in your heart of hearts or sing it out loud with me, but would you make this song a prayer to God? I make my life a prayer to you, Lord. I want to do what you want me to. No empty words and no white lies, no token prayers, no compromise. I want to shine the light you gave through your son you sent to save us from ourselves and our despair. It comforts me to know you're really there. You ready? Make my life a prayer to you. I make my life a prayer to you. I wanted you. I wanted you. What you want me to? No empty words. No empty words. And no white lies. No token prayers. No compromise. I want to shine the light you gave through your son, through your son, you sent to save us from ourselves and our despair. It comforts me to know you really live. God, you are the only one worthy of praise, and we praise you. We thank you for this time. We thank you, God, for everyone who's here. Thank you, God, that we can come to you and beg your forgiveness. God, we, we are so in love with the world. We're so comfortable with the world. God, no one will convince us of that except you. God, you know my heart. You know my prayer. You know, my desire for the people of God that, that you let me uh, live with and speak to. God, you know my desire for my heart. But Lord, I pray that we would all find ourselves wanting what you want for us in this life. Thank you for letting us be stewards. Thank you for letting us be managers of our time and our decisions and our stuff. God, we pray that you would be pleased with every decision we make. In your name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for coming.